Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to this next part of the Astronomy 101 series, uh, where we're going to talk about understanding what we know about stars. So um, previous videos, I've talked about um, things that you can measure about stars, um, their luminosity, which is how much light they give off. Um, the distance to the star, which is how you get the luminosity, um, because you can measure how bright it seems to you, but you also have to know how far away it is to get the true amount of energy coming from it. Um, talked about spectral lines um, and color, which tell you a little bit about uh, what the star is made of and what temperature the star is. Um, so here is an old-timey example of um, some stellar spectra. Um, with the sun at the top, um, these are absorption spectra or dark line spectra. And the pattern of lines tells you what's in it. Uh, it also gives you an idea of the temperature. So you can get the temperature from previous video by looking at the peak of the spectrum. So where it is at its brightest, but looking at the pattern of lines can actually get you the temperature as well. Um, these are uh, separated into certain types with these different letters. Um, there's a weird historical reason for that. Um, suffice to say, so they tried to make it alphabetical and um, realized that uh, it was actually uh, temperature if you rearranged them a certain way. Anyway, um, it's fun to come up with little mnemonics to remember these because they're just letters. Um, one of my favorites came from a student a couple years ago in this course of, oh boy, a freaking gorilla killed me. Um, so yeah, that's one you can use. You could make up your own. Um, it is helpful uh, to be able to see a letter like O and say, oh, I know an O star is really hot. Um, I know an A, F is in the middle. G type is our sun. Um, M type is really cool. Um, if you've been doing the video game labs along the way, um, you've already seen these spectral types um, because uh, one of the one of the tools looks at the, at the spectrum of a star and you use you compare it um, against typical uh, stars of these type. Now, um, if you take that rainbow spectrum and again flip it on its side, so you're really looking at how bright each wavelength is. You get a plot like this. This is uh, how we typically look at stellar spectra. Um, again, the top is O and it goes down all the way to M, uh, which is the coolest. So hottest at the top, coolest at the bottom. The um, luminosity or, uh, or flux over here is uh, just scaled so they all fit. So don't worry too much about that. But the wavelength shows you short wavelength on the left. So that's blue, purple, actually it's ultraviolet, purple, blue and then red uh, all the way to infrared over on the left side. Um, and as you see, as you go from hotter stars to cooler stars, one thing is the peak of that goes from shorter wavelengths. So the peak is past here. This is not super easy to see, but the G star, the peak is right about here, um, uh, like the 400, 420 mark, I guess. Uh, the coolest star, the M star, the peak is all the way out off the chart in the infrared. Um, so this matches what we saw with thermal spectra. But you can also see the dips, which are the absorption lines. Those dark lines show up as dips um, because the light is missing. Um, and you notice some of these have the same pattern somewhat in them. This is actually, those really obvious lines here are the hydrogen lines. Um, so they're hydrogens in every star in abundance, but you don't get all of those transitions if it's too hot for the O stars or too cool for like the K and M stars. Um, so you may not necessarily see those lines. But this is what it looks like um, for astronomers when they are getting spectral data. Okay, so we've measured these things. We've measured temperature in particular, and we've measured luminosity. One thing we do in science when we are not sure what's going on um, is we make plots. We make graphs. We'll plot one variable on the x-axis and one on the y-axis, and we'll plot a whole bunch of things and see if there's a relationship. Um, and in this case, 
um, there was a relationship found between the temperature and the luminosity. So this is a very famous plot called the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. Hertzsprung and Russell were two different astronomers who came up with the idea at the same time. Um, the bottom act, the x-axis, is temperature. Notice it's backwards. <laughs> High or hot temperatures are on the left. Um, your cooler, uh, lower temperatures are on the right. And that's because they first plotted them by their spectral type. So they went O, B, A, F, G, K, M. O, B, A, F, G, K, M means hottest is on the left and coolest is on the right. And now we're stuck with it. Um, luminosity does what you're, it's supposed to do. It's dim on um, the bottom and brighter at the top. And each star has a particular temperature and luminosity. So it has a particular spot on the diagram. So the sun, for example, is labeled in this diagram. Um, so the specific temperature and of the sun is a little less than 6,000 Kelvin. It says degrees, but it's Kelvin. Um, the brightness, this is in units of <laughs> comparing it to the sun. So it's one here. Um, sorry, the luminosity, not brightness. Um, a star that is cooler and dimmer than the sun would be like this one down here called AB Doradus C. See, it's at a temperature closer to 3000 Kelvin. It's 100,000 times less luminosity than the sun. Um, you can be cooler and brighter, and that gives you these big super giants up here. Um, you notice there are some stars that are hot and bright, some stars that are hot and dim. Um, so there's stars in different locations in the diagram, but they're not randomly spread throughout. There's actually um, something of a, a pattern to the way these are spread. Sorry, these uh, I've just added the um, axes. Uh, so you see temperature increases to the left, luminosity increases going up. Um, so it's not just randomly scattered all about. Right now, we're going to focus on this particular section. There is a clumping of stars from the top left to the bottom right. We call that part of the, of the diagram the main sequence. So these are all the stars in the main sequence that are currently fusing hydrogen into helium in their cores. So we talked about the sun. Uh, we talked about how in the core you have hydrogen fusing into helium. That's what gives the sun its energy. Um, and it's a pretty stable configuration. So all of these stars on the main sequence are fusing hydrogen into helium. Um, this is the, we call this the normal part of a star's lifetime. It spends the most of its time doing that activity. Um, now some stars are large and luminous and hot. Some stars are small and dim and less luminous. So there's a correlation here um, between temperature and luminosity um, and size as well. In fact, if you want an idea of the um, sizes, this is, this is uh, I think this is to scale uh, as far as, we, as well as we know. Um, of each of the types of stars on the main sequence diagram. So you see this diagram doesn't really do it justice comparing this size to this size. This is actually the difference in size between the hottest O stars all the way down to the coolest M stars. Again, these are main sequence stars. We're talking specifically about stars in the typical time of their life. There are other clumps on this diagram which tell us some other things. Um, there are some stars that have an extremely large radius, um, and those are ones that they can range in temperature from cool to hot, but they're very, very luminous. And they're very, very luminous because they're really, really big, so you've got more surface area. These are called giants and supergiants. These are stars that are typically in a later stage of their life. I'm going to talk about that in the next video, I think, um, how stars actually progress through different stages. But these stars um, are fusing something else in their core, something heavier than hydrogen. Um, and then there's also this clump down here of white dwarfs. They tend to be really, really hot, 
but they're really dim. So to be hot and dim means it's really, really, really tiny. And uh, that's also, um, those, I don't think, you know, they don't have active fusion going on. So we'll talk about where those fit in. Um, oh, I have one more. Um, I don't know if I put the link to the video, um, but there is a nice little video on YouTube. Let's see if I can get it running. Um, that shows you the relative sizes of planets and stars. So um, it starts with Mercury and goes up to the Earth, and then it zooms out and there's Earth and the rest of the solar system. And then it starts comparing, um, uh, there's the sun, and different stars. So they'll start to go into the giants and supergiants. This may actually work. <laughs> Let's find out. <laughs> All right. Bring this over. You can see it. I'm gonna turn the music down. Um, things don't actually float, but we'll let that go because they made a really cute video. Um, so actually, oh, sorry. This starts with the moon something that uh, we see in the sky and we think is a pretty large thing. Um, going out to Mercury, Mars, these are all the planets of the inner solar system, so the small rocky planets. Venus and Earth, roughly the same size. If they show us as being a little bigger. And then all oh, you have to go all the way huge to get to Neptune and Uranus, which are both um, gas slash ice giants. Uh, the biggest planet in the solar system is Jupiter. And then that's how big the sun is in comparison to those. Sirius A is a white dwarf. No, I think that, mm, Sirius B is a white dwarf star. Um, but that's a main sequence star. Orange giant. Uh, here's a red giant, so a cooler giant. An even bigger giant. Um, and now some of the super giants. Rigel is a star you can see in the constellation LIGO. Pistol Star is the heaviest known star. It's like 100 times the mass of the sun. Uh, Antares is a bright one you can see in the sky right now near the Big Dipper. Um, but these, yeah, these large red stars. This is the largest known star in terms of, of size. So you see, you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger compared to the size of this gigantic star, the lo largest one we know of. There's the Earth. <laughs> We're super tiny. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna pause here and get rid of that. So just, you know, blow your mind a little bit with this, how big things are actually in space. Um, so back to that main sequence. So we have stars that are spending most of their lifetime with a specific temperature and specific luminosity. So it's a specific point in this plot or this diagram. Um, the mass at this end, the top left, is the highest mass for super main sequence stars. And then the mass decreases as you go down to the coolest stars. So your mass, um, your position on the main sequence determines your mass. Your mass tells you how long that star has to live. Um, and in fact, it tells you everything you need to know about the star's life cycle from birth to death. So we're gonna start very generally. Um, we're not gonna spend um, t too much time talking about the interstellar medium. So that's the gas and dust in between the stars, um, but that is where stars are formed. So they'll start to clump from um, really dense areas of gas. Um, tend to make stars in clusters. So a whole bunch of them were born together. Um, and when you do that, the universe tends to make more small things than big things. Um, you can think of this as comparing um, uh, like sand on the beach. Um, you're gonna get lots and lots of tiny grains. You're only gonna see a few pebbles and you, you know, you might have to walk miles and miles down the beach till you find a boulder, right? The universe tends to make more of the tiny things than the big things. So in a cluster, um, all of these types of stars are made from M all the way to O. Uh, but a lot of them are the smaller, cooler, uh, less massive ones. Um, and then you get less and less as you go all the way out 
to the hottest, biggest, most luminous ones, um, you make fewer of those. So you're going to tend to get a whole lot of red dwarf stars um, and just a few of those biggest blue stars. Uh, those stars, uh, pulling from the, the sun chapter, um, are all in some kind of gravitational equilibrium for the most part. Um, fusion, the energy of fusion is pushing uh, pressure outwards, and the gravity, um, the mass of the outer layers of the star are pushing inward, and those about equal out, so it stays at a constant size. Um, In a larger star, you have more material pressing down. So the fusion um, from the core has to be pushing out even more. So there's uh, also because you have a bigger star, it's a lot hotter and higher pressure in the center of a big star than it is for a small star. So a, a high core temperature and a really high pressure means the fusion rate is also really high. That means it's going through its stock of hydrogen to make helium a lot faster than the smaller stars. Uh, one way, whoops, one way to talk about that is, um, you know, the big stars like live fast and die hard. Um, they have short lifetimes. They run out of their fuel faster, but that's because um, the the fusion. There's so the fusion is so much more energetic um, in the time that it is alive. So, once a star runs out of hydrogen in the center um, to fuse into helium, um, it's going to start undergoing changes. So that fusion shuts off, so that means you don't have, previous slide, that pressure pushing outwards from fusion. So what's going to happen is you're going to start, the star is going to start to collapse. Um, and the star is going to start to go through some changes. Um, which I'll detail a bit more in the next video. Suffice to say right now, if its size is changing, its luminosity is changing, if it's uh, getting smaller, uh, it's also heating up, if it's getting bigger, it's cooling off. Um, so now its luminosity and temperature are changing. We say that a star that is changing its luminosity and temperature is moving on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, or the HR diagram. So it was originally here, say, for the sun. Um, the changes that are going on inside are going to push it to another part of a diagram. We say moving on the HR diagram. Uh, that does not mean it's moving in space. It just means its characteristics are changing. But that motion <laughs> on the um, HR diagram can be plotted over time. So this gray one's actually showing um, what the protostar that will become a star like the sun is like. See how it gets hotter and dimmer and then brighter over time. Um, sun, for example, is going to spend most of its life on the main sequence, 10 billion years. After 10 billion years or so, it's going to run out of that hydrogen. Things are going to change and it's going to cause it to change where it is on this diagram. So it's going to move. You get this life track or this path on the main sequence. Now for a bunch of stars, if you're looking at a whole bunch of stars in one cluster, these are, these are all born together, um, the ma most massive ones are gonna die off first. So the right hand diagram, the right side of this diagram, those stars are gonna die first. And then those stars are gonna die. And then those stars are gonna die. It all depends on the star's mass. So over time, you're gonna lose the big blue ones um, from your main sequence and you're going to uh, your most massive star that's left over is going to be less massive than the ones that were originally there. Um, this is a, a something that we call the main sequence turnoff. Um, this, uh, if you're doing the video game labs then um, you've seen this already in the Pleiades cluster uh, mission. Um, surveying a cluster, they ask you to fill in the HR diagram um, and it says a bunch of stuff. Um, where the top left of the diagram that's left over after, you know, the ones up here have died, um, gives you an idea of how old the cluster is. So this example shows us two different clusters. Uh, M67 stars are shown. 
sorry. M67 stars are shown in yellow. NGC 188 stars are shown in teal. Um, you can see from this that M67 has more massive stars at the top of its main sequence than the other one does. That means the yellow one is younger. Um, it was formed more recently. So the star that's at the top of the diagram is the star that's about to die off, right? So the lifetime of that star at the top of the diagram tells you the age of the whole cluster. Because again, star clusters uh, like this, uh, all the stars are born at roughly the same time. So even though, for example, an M67, it's got all these hot big ones and it's got a lot of um, cool dim ones, um, they're all going to be the same age. They're all going to be the age of, or the match the lifetime of the one that's about to die off the main sequence. Um, some people liken it to a wick of a candle, like the wick burns down over time. Um, if you knew how quickly the flame burned through the wick material, you could use the length of the wick that's left um, to tell you how much time has passed, for example. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna stop there. Um, next sections, we'll be talking a bit about what actually is happening to these stars. Um, but for now, uh, the really cool result is that uh, you can figure out the age of a star. Can't figure out the age of a star by itself super easily. You can figure out the age of all the stars in a cluster using this technique, the HR diagram. Okay, so summarize. HR diagram plots stars with temperature and luminosity, uh, and you see certain patterns emerge on the diagram. They're not just randomly everywhere. So that tells us, hey, there's a relationship here. There's physical relationships between the luminosity and the temperature um, and other stuff on the diagram. Um, the mass of a main sequence star determines its core pressure and temperature. Um, the core pressure and temperature, if it's higher, the fusion is more rapid. Fusion, fuser, bleh, words. fusion of hydrogen into helium is a lot more rapid. Um, and so it burns, a lot, burns a bad word. Um, it gives off energy at a much higher rate. So it's super, super luminous, but it runs out of fuel faster. So it's shorter lived. So high mass stars are hot and luminous and run out faster, die faster. Um, the low mass stars the low mass stars uh, live quite a bit longer because they fuse at a much lower rate. Um, so the HR diagram is useful when you plot all the stars in a particular cluster because it tells you not only properties of the individual stars, but it gives you an idea of how old or young that cluster is. Um, so you really can't get that from a star itself, but you can get that from the whole cluster. Um, all right, that's it for this one. I will see you next time.